of the girl. Sixteen? Where is this? Yeah. East 75th in the base. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow by transcription the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. The officers are on their way over there now. You wait outside for them. Show them where it is. An ambulance, too. An ambulance is coming. All right. They'll be there right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It was a cold, windy night, and I was on patrol in sector car number two with patrolman Edward Farrell as operator and myself as recorder. It was about 11.30 p.m., and I had instructed Farrell to drive west on 75th Street from 1st Avenue to Lexington, and then return to the station house where I was due to turn out the platoon for the late tour at midnight. After we crossed 1st Avenue, there was no traffic in the block ahead of us, and I saw no pedestrians. Cold weather keeps them off the streets. It's a good policeman. Our headlights cut a swath in the darkness as we cruised slowly in the long block toward 2nd Avenue. Captain, that old man down there, I think he wants us. Go ahead, pull up. Yes, sir. Okay. Come on, pal. All right. What is that? What's the trouble, Tom? Killing her. Where? In the basement there. Let's go, Farrell. Down there. Watch the step. No, I got my light. All right, hit the door. Get away, Farrell. Get away. Put your hands on me. I'll kill you all. Oh, still there. I mean, I get up again. Get the nipples on him. Trouble now, mister. Stay still or you've got plenty more. He's all right now, Captain. All right, get those hands against the wall. Get them up there. They're all right, okay. Okay. Sit down on the floor. He said sit down on the floor. All right, yeah. Don't kill her yet. I'll kill her. You won't kill anybody, mister. Watch it, Captain. Let me take a look at her. Stay still. No, don't, please. It's all right. I'm a police officer. Oh, my side. Kick me my side. She's only a kid, pal. All right. How old are you? Sixteen. My side. My side is killing. My face. All right. Just take it easy. We'll get help. Watch him, pal. I'm going to call in for an ambulance. I got him, sir. Everything okay. Come on upstairs, Tom. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You know that girl? Yeah, sure, the Truro girl from my building. This building? No, the next building, that, that one, fourth floor is. You know him? No, I never seen him. You live with her folks? Her folks, yes. Yeah. All right, you go upstairs and tell them, okay? Yeah, yeah, tell them. All right, I go. Car 681 to Central, okay? Car 681 to Central. At 388 East 75th Street in the basement. East 753K. That's right. An assault case. Send an ambulance and assistance. K. Okay, 681 21st Precinct. The address. 388 East 75th Street. Car 634 635. Signal 32. The ambulance is responding. K. 634 10 Car 635. Within a few minutes, in response to the radio signal, sector car number four and the sergeant's car were on the job. When the call was heard on the radio monitor by the desk officer at the station house, he notified the 21st squad and Detective James McLeese and Louis DeLuca hurried to the scene. As we waited for the arrival of the ambulance, the assailant, Joe Pacquiao, sat on the floor in a corner of the basement with his back against the wall under the guard of patrolman Farrell. 
The victim's mother had been summoned from the apartment. She tried to comfort the girl. Anita, my baby, my baby. He wanted to kill me, Mom. He tried to. Oh, my baby. Oh. Mrs. Toro, don't touch her, please. Oh, my baby. Where's the doctor? She's got. Now, the ambulance is on the way. Well, where, where is it? <laughs> Mrs. Toro, you'd uh, better stand over here. No. It'd be better for her. Go on, Mom. Go on, baby. Mrs. Toro. Yes, all right. The ambulance will be here right away. Sergeant. Yes, sir. My poor baby. Yes, sir, Captain. Yes. Stay here with the girl. Yes, sir. Is that the ambulance, that siren? Yes, I'm sure it is. Uh, let's go over here, Mrs. Toro. I don't like to leave her. I don't like to leave my baby. How old is she? Sixteen. Just sixteen. Is she got? She won't die. No, I think she'll be all right. Excuse me, Captain. Oh, yes, McLeese. Uh, this is the girl's mother, Mrs. Toro, Detective McLeese. I'd like to ask you two questions, Mrs. Toro. Yeah, anything. That's the ambulance? Yes. Good. Oh, my poor baby. This fellow, this Joe Packers, he said he's known her for a long time. Oh, six months, maybe seven. But she don't want anything to do with him. Uh-huh. He comes around to the house, he stares us off. He brings a bottle of whiskey, he sits down in the kitchen. He says he wants to marry her. She don't want anything to do with him. But we're scared. Well, then why didn't you call the police? I said once I would. I said, get out or I call the police. He said, what would the police do to him? Nothing. He'd come back and tear up the house. So I didn't call. He'd come. Anita would lock herself in the bathroom. We were all scared. Well, where was she tonight? Did she have a date with him? Oh, no. She went to a girlfriend's on First Avenue. We do a homework together. Uh-huh. She's a good girl, Anita. She goes to school. She wants to learn. She wants to learn to go to business. All right, bring it in. They, they take her where? To a hospital? Yes. What hospital? Could I go? Yes, you can go. I mean, what was he doing? Was he waiting for her on the street? I guess. I don't know. I want to help. Uh, let's leave it to them, Mr. Toro. They know what they're doing. All right, easy. Easy. Oh, Put her on. My baby, my poor baby. Oh, Mom, Mom. Oh. All right, all right. Take it out. Oh. Come to the house. He said, where is she? I said, out. He sat down with a bottle of whiskey for two, three hours. I was scared. Now watch the turn there, easy. All right, Miss. Up with us. He said he'd kill her. He'd kill me. I was glad he went. Easy now. Keep it high. Can I go with her? Can I? Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. See that Mrs. Toro gets over to the hospital. Yes, sir. Oh, wait. Wait for me. You can talk to the mother later, can't you, McLeese? Oh, yes, sir. Right now, I want to talk to that bum over there. All right, you men. Don't stand around here. Get back on patrol. How's he doing, pal? All the steam's out of him, Captain. He's no trouble. All right, you get on your feet. Why? You first, man. Hey, get on your feet. My please. Yes, Captain. What's your name? Packus. Joe Packus. How do you spell that? P-A-K-U-S. And where do you live? East 81st Street, 816. What do you do to justify your existence? What do you mean? Have you got a job? Yeah, I work. Where? Different places. Contractors. I'm a plaster. How old are you? 27. 27, huh? Yeah. Well, you grow gray by the time you're through with this one, mister. I'll teach you to leave that family alone. I'll teach you to stay away from 16-year-old girls. I want to marry her. I love what her. a fine way to show her you love her, isn't it? Almost killing her. You're no good. You're plain no good. I was a little drunk. Oh, that's a great excuse, isn't it? You get half in the bag and you think you own the world. Well, I'll show you what you own. You don't own any part of it. You don't even own your own time. All right, Mike. Take it easy. He should be in the hospital, not her. Well, that's enough. Joe, what are you coming around here making trouble for that family? I told you they didn't want anything to do with you. I want her. I want to marry the girl. She won't speak to me. She won't see me. She can out with other guys. All right, I waited for her tonight. To talk to her, just to talk. When I saw her, she tried to go away. She wouldn't talk. Okay, sister, you'll talk. You'll do what I tell you. You threw her down in the cellar, and you beat her up, and you almost killed her, and she might die. Yes, it was a whiskey. I didn't mean it. Sixteen-year-old girl. Sixteen? I don't know. I don't care. I want to marry. She's a woman. And you're a man, huh? Well, not in my book, mister. In my book, you're enough. A great big cipher. A 
suspect, Joe Pacquius, was taken to the station house in the custody of Patrolman Farrell, the first officer on the scene. Detective McLeese rode with them in sector car number two, and I returned in the sergeant's car just in time to turn off the platoon for the late tour at midnight. At the station house, Pacquius was taken upstairs to the 21st squad, still in the custody of Patrolman Farrell. There, he would be questioned further by detectives and on completion of the investigation, booked in on charges of felonious assault. As the senior officer on duty in the 6th Division during the night, I was called to the 25th Precinct, where a three-alarm fire in a loft building had caused the evacuation of two tenements. It was 2.20 a.m. when I returned to the 21st Precinct and walked into the muster room and around the desk to sign the blotter. Hello, Sergeant. Captain. Uh, Captain. Red. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. What about that poor old girl in the hospital, Red? How bad is she? Uh, two broken ribs, Captain. Her face is pretty badly cut up. No internal injuries, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman, Iceman bringing in. He made that notification on York Avenue. He got hold of the brother. Okay. All right, Iceman. Did they book that Joe Pacquius yet, Red? No, sir, not yet. They still got him upstairs. Mm-hmm. What about Sal? He's still there. As soon as he's booked in, and you'll get a couple of hours sleep before he has to go to court with him. That's a mean one, that guy, Captain. Sixteen-year-old girl. Yeah. I'll be in my office, then. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. Oh, Sergeant. Yeah, all right. You take your meal now, right? Okay. Yes, sir, Captain. Sergeant, I'll tell you what. I want you to... What's that? In the back room. Come on, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Somebody fell down the steps. Yes, sir. That's what happened. Are you all right? What happened, Mac? He tripped, fell down a whole flight of stairs. Did he? Pacquiao. He's out. He's out like a light. What's going on? What happened? Where were you, Sal? He's your prisoner. Well, Captain, what? Uh, Just uh, a second. Pacquiao. Come on. Pacquiao. Sergeant, ring for an ambulance, will you? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, he's out, all right. All right, Sal. Where were you? Oh, we're taking him down to book him. He left his hat in the squad room. I went back inside for it. You were alone with him, McLeese. That's right, Captain. Yes, sir. How'd he fall? I don't know. He tripped, I guess. Did he? On what? Captain, I didn't lay a hand on him. If anybody deserved to get thrown down those stairs, he did, but I didn't lay a hand on him. We'll find out about that, McLeese. We'll find out about that right away. You're listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Since 1910, the work output of each of us has more than doubled. In the same period, machine power has increased four and a half times, and the average annual income has gone from $2,400 a year to about $4,000 a year in equivalent purchasing power. In spite of all this, about 18 hours has been cut off the average work week in the same period. Those facts are but a few in the great story of our American economic system, a story that adds up to this for all of us. The better we produce, the better we live. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank and I. Any unusual occurrence concerning a prisoner, injury, death, escape, or attempted suicide is a grave matter. The commanding officer of the precinct concerned is required to make an immediate and thorough investigation and forward his report to the office of the chief inspector and the New York State Commissioner of Corrections. Joe Pacquiao did not regain consciousness by the time the ambulance arrived. He was taken to Bellevue Hospital. In the meantime, I had instructed the desk officer, Lieutenant Gorman, to telephone Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, at his home and inform him of the incident. Lieutenant King was at the station house within 25 minutes and sat in my office as I questioned first Patrolman Farrell. No, sir, I didn't leave him for a minute, not since I brought him in. You got him into the station house about five minutes to 12. How come you didn't bring him downstairs to be booked until 25 after 2? Well, McLeese was conducting an investigation, Captain. Well, there wasn't much investigation that needed conducting, was there? You were an eyewitness to the assault, so was I. Yes, sir. And you had another witness, that old man that stopped you. Yes, sir. Did McLeese make any threats against this Joe Pacquiao up in the squad room? No, sir. You just talked to him calmly? Well, not exactly calmly, Captain. McLeese didn't think much of the guy who did. Did either you or he use any violence in the squad room? No, sir. 
Well, then when you started downstairs to book him, what happened? Well, we came out of the squad room and into the hall. I had packed his body arm. As soon as we got outside, McLeod said his hat. We left his hat inside. Whose hat? Joe Packett. Didn't Pack Hill say anything about it? No, sir. I, I guess he forgot. So you went back for his hat? Yes, sir. That was your prisoner, Farrell. You weren't supposed to leave him. But it was just back in the squad room. We were out in the hall. I, I didn't really leave him, Captain. And when you came out with the hat, Pack Hill was down at the bottom of the stairs. Yes, sir. You were in the squad room with Pack Hill all the time, between about midnight and 2.25? Yes, sir. Was it McLeese? No, sir. Where'd he go? Well, when we first got there, he printed packets. Then we went into your office, Lieutenant. And the police started to question him. He didn't touch him, you said. No, sir. He, he got awful mad at him, but he didn't touch him. And then about 1 o'clock, the police went out. Well, where'd he go? I don't know, Captain. He said he'd be back. We book him in when he got back. I just sat there with packets until he came back. About, oh, 10 minutes after 2. Any more questions, man? No, sir. All right, Sal, that's all. Yes, sir. You can go on home. Packers won't be going to court tomorrow. How is it, Captain? Oh, we're waiting to hear. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Sal. Yes, sir. Tell McLeese to come in here. Yes, sir. Uh, well, Matt, looks like a rough spot, doesn't it? It sure timed out right. Yep. I'm kind of anxious to hear what Packers has to say. Well, he was unconscious when they took him out of here. He was unconscious when they got him to the hospital. Oh. We might not get to hear what he has to say, eh, Captain? Doesn't look good for him, Matt. It was an awful wallop on the head he took. Come in. Yes, Captain. Oh. Sit down over here, McLeese. Yes, Hello, Lieutenant. Yes, please. Sit down. Yes, sir. Well, you got yourself in a jam, huh? I'm not in any jam, Lieutenant. What do you call it? Excuse me. Sure, sir. 21st, please, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Collins, Captain. Lieutenant Gorman would like to talk to you. Okay. Go ahead. Captain? Yes, sir. The doctor down at Bellevue just called back. Yes? Possible, that's all they know. Well, they're making x-rays now. Yeah. He didn't regain consciousness? No, sir, not yet. All right, Brad, if you hear anything else, ring in here, hmm? Yes, sir. How is he, Captain? Possible fractured skull. I didn't push him down those stairs. He tripped. Now, Cleese, I've been in command of this precinct two years. Every day, 24 hours a day, people go up and down those stairs. All kinds of people. Cops, complainants, drunks, narcotics addicts, everything. In two years, the only man to fall down those stairs is somebody you've been holding back your temper on all night. From top to bottom, he fell and fractured his skull. I didn't lay a hand on him, Captain. And it happens just when you send the only possible witness back into the squad room for a hat. Nobody around, only you. He tripped and fell, Captain. I didn't touch him. You were itching through all night, though, weren't you, McLeese? Well, who wouldn't? I'm only human. A guy weighs almost 200 pounds, and he's no good. He's not even near human. He'd be the 16-year-old girl within this far of killing her, and he would have killed her if the captain and Farrell didn't jump him. So what am I supposed to do, love a guy like this like a brother? I want to see him get what's coming to him. That's just the point exactly. You're a cop, that's all. You're not the judge and jury. It's not up to you to see that he gets what's coming to him. Your job is to bring him and the facts before the people who decide that. Not to set yourself up in a throne and decide who's right and who's wrong. That's not your job. Get that through your head. Yes, sir. Did you throw him down the stairs? No, sir. He tripped and fell. Where'd you go about 1 o'clock? I went out for a meal, sir. Where else? You were gone over an hour. Roosevelt Hospital. Why? To interview the victim and her mother. Did you? I saw the mother, Captain. The victim was still in the treatment room. You didn't need the mother or the girl. You had two police officers and a noble civilian as eyewitness. Yes, sir. There wasn't any doubt in your mind that on Farrell's testimony alone, Pacquiao would be held without bail for the grand jury, was there? No, sir. Well, then why did you have to go to the hospital at that point? I don't know, Captain. I, I thought I ought to get the girl's story. This was a felony case. Did he call the district attorney? No, sir. Why not? 
Those are your instructions, aren't they? It looked open and shut to me. It looks open and shut to me, too, McLeese. I've got the same feeling about it. After the interview with Detective McLeese, Lieutenant King instructed him to return to his duty. At 3.30 a.m., Lieutenant King and I drove to Roseville Hospital where we found the mother of the assault victim waiting in the corridor. Mrs. Kuro told us her daughter was at last asleep and that she intended to wait at the hospital for any word about her condition. We said nothing of the injury to Joe Packy as to the mother. In order to talk to her, we suggested that she have something to eat. She went with us to a nearby all-night luncheonette. Do you want something else besides the soup, Mrs. Kuro? No, it's enough to the soup. Some coffee? No, nothing. Poor Anita, poor baby. I don't understand how she happened to get involved with this guy. How did that happen? Oh, girlfriend knew him. They met. He wanted to come to school to take her on dates and so forth. She didn't want to. She didn't want anything to do with him. He used to come in the house, breaking on those drunk like a maniac. Scared her. Scared me. Sit in the kitchen and holler. He wants to marry her. Push me around. I was scared of him. Well, you don't have to worry about him anymore. I'm still scared. Believe me, Mr. Trollo. He's got brothers. He goes to jail to send his brothers. They're just as bad. One came with him once to the house. Just as bad. I don't want anything more to do with him. I move. I take a need. It's just the two of us. That's all. You'll be in jail? No, that's worse. The brothers will find us. I don't want anything to do with sending him to jail. I told the detective that. I said to him before. Detective McLeese? Yes, McLeese. I told him I didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, what did he say? He said not to be scared. I don't have to. He said Joe Packness would be fixed. Fixed good. Nobody would bother us. Not anymore. Fixed good, hmm? Yeah. I told him, don't fix him. When the brothers come around, they fix us. I told him. Maybe I ought to go back to the hospital. This is very nice, but maybe Anita wakes up, and where am I? Finish your soup, Mrs. Kuro. Yeah, all right. Then we go, huh? Yes. I'm going to ring in, man. Order me another cup of coffee, will you? All right, Captain. I'll be right back. Very good soup for a restaurant. Canelli, Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir. The Lama wants to speak to you, Captain. He, uh, he tried the hospital. We left there. Put him on. Yes, sir. Captain Canelli, Lieutenant. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Gorman. Yes, Red. Captain, I got a call from the Department of Correction man at the prison ward in Bellevue. Packy, if he's not dead. No, sir. Far from it. He's regained consciousness. The doctor says if you want to talk to him for a few minutes, Okay. No fractured skull or concussion, just a bad bump. He's okay. We took Mrs. Toro back to Roosevelt and then drove downtown to Bellevue Hospital. We drove into the grounds at 30th Street and Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive and parked the car. The prison ward on the second floor of I Building is under supervision of the Department of Correction. Upstairs, we were admitted through the barred gates and directed to the room. Thank you very much. It's over there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Who are you? We're police officers. I want to see my lawyer. It's the only one I want to see. You'll see your lawyer. Wise guys, that's all you are, a bunch of wise guys. Wise guys, huh? What does that make you, beating up a 16-year-old girl, a big hero? I want to see my lawyer. Tell us how you came to fall down the stairs. My lawyer. That's the only one I'll tell. I don't want nothing to do with you guys. You've got something to do with us. You've got plenty to do with us. Tell us about how you got hurt. Go ahead. Hit me, hit me. See what it'll get you. 
Nobody's going to hit you. Laying hair on my back. Hit me. Go on. I'll get more. Get more what? Money, that's what. you get nothing but years, Joe. I'll get money. I'm going to push your basket full. I'll sue the city. I'll take them over the coal for that kind of treatment. What kind of treatment? Never mind. I'll take it up with my lawyer. What about slapping that girl around? What do you think your lawyer can do for that? Nothing. I ain't worried. I'll take only half the money I'm going to sue for, and the city will be glad to get off the hook. I'll get off with nothing. I'll buy a car, and I'll go to Florida. You've got great ambitions, Joe. I guess we'll pin a medal on you, too. Huh? I wouldn't be surprised. I'll talk to my lawyer about it. I got the city dead to rights. They can't do that to a guy and get away with it. You don't seem hurt so bad, Joe. Yeah, well, the pain's killing me. What makes you think you're entitled to sue the city? Those stairs come top to bottom. Look, the detective said you tried to break away from him and missed the top step. That's a lie. Well, what did happen? Oh, no. You take that up with my lawyer. But I wasn't trying to break away. Don't let him tell you I was. He's lying. I don't think so. I wasn't. I was walking down as quiet as you could. There was this thing sticking up, caught the heel of my shoe. That's the city's fault, ain't it? I tripped and I went down, down to the bottom. I looked at those stairs, Joe. That's not what happened. Tell us the truth now. I caught my heel. I caught it on the step. I fell. I tripped on something that was sticking up. I tripped and fell. The city has to pay for that, don't they? That detective wouldn't tell you what happened. He don't like me. He don't want me to collect, doesn't he? Like he never beat up a woman. <laughs> Big man. Get him to tell you the truth. We will, Joe. Come on, man. Yes. How long, Joe? Get him to tell you. Well, big night, man. Yes, sir. You know, I've got to admit it. I thought my police gave him at least a little help down those stairs. Captain, I was sure of it. Oh, thank you, boys. Got a light, man? Yes. Cigarette? No, thanks. Much obliged. We told McLeese he shouldn't try to be judge and jury. You know something, man? Neither should we. First precinct, Sergeant Collins. What do you mean, Rob? Held up? Where is he? The what barn grill? Oh. What's the address? Yeah. Did they have guns? How many men? How many? Well, which way did they go? Were they in a car? What kind of a car? What kind? What color? And so it goes around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a transcribed factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city. It's presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Quinn, Louis Van Ruten, Phil Sterling, Joan Morgan, Barbara Weeks, Jack Orison, and John Larkin. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Bob Hall speaking. <laughs>